I'm going to 100% Mario and Rabbids Sparks of Hope, which includes completing every quest and finding all of the collectibles. Looks like Mario's dating the floozy version of Peach now. When you wish upon a star. <laughs> hey, little guy, you're kind of cute. It's a me. A Mario. Rabbit Peach finds this to be the perfect opportunity to take a selfie, not realizing the immediate danger she is now in. Mario jumps into action to save his girlfriend. You may wonder what he sees in her. Well, at least she's not being supposedly captured all the time by Bowser. Mario's got a gun. With the couple packing heat and working as a team, Rabbit Peach throws an egg at a weak point. Over already? Did you just talk? Guess we'll find out about that later since the enemy reveals themselves appearing to be some kind of cosmic giant. It uses its eye to mind control some nearby Goombas. <laughs> you really thought Goombas were gonna help you out? Looks like our friends are here to save us from you anyways. They grab us by the hand and then fly on out of there by the skin of our teeth. We aboard the ship sharing the name of our new threat. Cursa. Beepo introduces us to his new AI creation, Genie. Then they introduce us to the voice acting in this game. Hello, remember me, the entity who created you? Hey, little fella. Let's get some real voice acting in this game. What is this place? Anyways, Genie shares some data about the rabid Lumas. We decide to call them Sparks instead. Starburst, the name of the spark with us now, tells us that Cursa has done something terrible to Rosalina. In order to save her, we need to gather purified energy to trek across the galaxy. Meanwhile, Cursa is plotting against us, sending three of her henchmen after us. We arrive at our first destination, Beacon Beach. The warden of this world, Augie. Doesn't seem to be too keen on having visitors since the planet is already in trouble. We, of course, do the heroic thing of offering to help. So he asks us to remove these creepy tentacles from their lighthouse. Ever since the slimy stuff appeared, the sun has disappeared. Genie informs us that the black stuff is actually called darkness. Like a darkness, except it's a mess. This crap is all over the place, and we're going to have to clean up every bit we see. Each of them represents a number of enemies that we either need to defeat or fulfill some other sort of objective. I took it classic with my first fight using the Super Mario Bros. Luigi has great range with his bow and arrow, while Mario dual wields two guns. The village is on lockdown because of a bomb threat, so we spring into action. You're gonna want to treat these waddlers a little differently than the usual enemy, preferably by dashing into them then chucking them at their own kind. Once that's taken care of, the villagers are free to leave their homes. This rabbit tries to show its appreciation by showing us a spark which immediately runs away when released from the bag. It hides within this sun crest, which unearths some sort of palace. That poor spark got spooked and flew away. I really thought we'd bonded too. Dude, you had shoved it into a bag, you dimwit. Whatever, we'll enter the temple and get the spark ourselves. But it looks like I'm too late. The spark is surrounded by stooges. That is until... Some goth girl comes along. Friend or foe? Time will tell. Total concentration. Water breathing. First form. Ah. Eh. She looks friendly enough. That doesn't, though. Looks like we have our first boss fight. Best part about it, though, is we get to use three characters. One of them has to be Edge, our new friend. She proves handy, though, with a flying blade doing decent damage while keeping her distance. <laughs> And that's pretty much the plan against this pussycat. I have my three characters somewhat form a triangle since every time you attack the big guy, it comes closer to you. With the triangle method, it gets pulled in a different direction after each attack, leading to a flawless victory. Augie pops out of nowhere, congratulating us on the win, then kindly reminds us to fix the lighthouse. Along the way, we do a few side quests, like helping Professor Backpack, with a riddle that sheds some history on Augie being a disappointment to his father. Finishing side quests rewards you with the planet's currency, which you can use to purchase a unique key to open up the world's secret level. This one brings you to a colorful dimension where you need to maneuver around some bad guys. At the end, a new spark awaits. All right, back to restoring the lighthouse. What awaits us at the top seems to be an overwhelming amount of evil eyeballs and this chunky boy. To adapt, I change my lineup to include Peach and Rabid Luigi. I'm warning you now, don't ever get on Peach's bad side. She has an umbrella that contains a shotgun, allowing her to blast away a numerous amount of these eyeballs at once. Rabid Luigi is also a great choice because his ultimate frisbee college days are now paying off with his disc ricocheting to multiple targets as well. With the ooze cleared, the rainstorm comes to an end and the sun reappears. Here comes the sun. 
The villagers rejoice, and we now have enough purified energy to travel some more when we're ready. Sun's out. Fun's out. Calm down, pervert. Looks like popping the lighthouse tentacles made a bit of a mess, but I'll be sure to clean it all up before leaving. Some of these dark mist puddles are missions that require certain characters. Like this one, you can only use Rabbit, Mario, and Peach. These two make a great combo since they're both naturally tanky, with Peach buffing their defenses even more, Rabbit Mario attacking up close with fists like Vi from Arcane, then Peach firing from a distance. I wonder what's in this house over here. You are doomed! Her name is Madame Boisrella, who provides another level for you to beat. And she's not legally responsible for outcome? Love you too, lady. 37 enemies to defeat, most of them being Goombas. What a tedious grind. Back at the beach, I gather up the missing discs for DJ Cheap Tuna. DJ Kami! Weird guy, but the group is enjoying it. One of his speakers seems to be possessed, and oh, what a surprise, it actually is. Cleaning it up is an urgent matter, because DJ Cheap Tuna will be sued if a fan gets swallowed up. I use the same strategy that I did atop of the lighthouse, with the exception of having Rabid Mario as a third member since his melee attacks prove effective, knocking out four eyes at once. Take it easy. Ah. Hey! hey. Take it easy. The beach party is back on, and even the cheap cheeps join in on the dancing. Just had a couple more things to do before leaving, including my first matchup against armored Goombas, who can't be hurt with guns, but can be dashed into, then thrown off. Later, I gathered up some fish, which I chucked into a fountain, went back to the temple to fix some art, which triggered a secret exit that a spark flew out of, so we followed, and were led to a dark mist gate that the spark got stuck in. After throwing eight bombs at it, Electro Dash was free and joined us. Only one side quest remained but we needed more sparks from future worlds to even challenge it. So I bought out all of the weapon skins and memories being sold at the shop, returned to the ship, then navigated over to the next world, Pristine Peaks. And would you look at that? Another spark already! The difference with this one is it goes into Beepo giving him sonic powers. This ability can knock over large stones that we can then cross, and shatters rocks. Up next is a special mission for the Mario Bros. Cue the music. Yo, yo, it's the Mario Brothers, and plumbing's the game. Now, even Koopa and his troopers are up to misbehaving. Uh, s sorry about that. I just love that song. As we climb the mountain looking for this planet's warden, Genie advises that we should start equipping two sparks with each character during our battles now. Come to think of it, I haven't really shown much of the sparks, have I? Well, they're basically like another move slot. Here's Luigi using one to enhance his weapon with fire, burning the enemy lone wolf upon on shooting it, the original spark we met at the beginning of the game can increase the damage output of nearby allies for that turn, and I'll highlight more along my journey. Similar to the previous area, clearing out the evil spot brought out the sun, melting a lot of the ice that blocked our ability to explore. Do you wanna build a snowman? No. In fact, with 12 sparks gathered, I headed back to Beacon Beach to finish the remaining side quest. Meet Giant Messy Goomba. It brought some friends into battle with it, but I killed those guys first. That way it was just us and the Goomba left. I had it chase my trio to a corner while we shot at it each turn, eventually leading to the monster's defeat. Mission complete! Back to Pristine Peaks where I save a penguin stuck in a tree, just to throw it off a nearby cliff. Nah, I'm just kidding. I put them on a boat that just so happens to have Curse's ooze leaking from it. You know, you bad guys need to stop laying around your kryptonite right next to you. Really not a good idea. But you guys do you, because I love getting new sparks. Now here's something I gotta highlight. Every world seems to have their own silly fish challenge, but this time I noticed the music for this segment, which is a remix of a Super Mario World song. By the way, my favorite team composition so far has been both the Peaches alongside Rabid Mario. Take a look at their skill tree. Extra dash for Rabid Mario. Mario. Extra dash for Peach. And Rabbit Peach will soon have three total dashes. Rabbit Mario and Peach also have great mobility, which makes up for their lack of range since they prefer to attack up close. I'll share more about their synergy later. For now, I'll build an igloo for this Rabbit. Drake? <laughs> what? Where's the door hole? It goes right there. See, I drew it with a magic marker. <laughs> you were supposed to cut it out with the power saw. Dude, I'm gonna. After that, we finally find the warden who was frozen in ice. He's not the brightest trying to pull open this push door. He asks us to find a girl that's trapped inside the palace. Once inside, we're greeted right away with a spark named Pyrogeddon, who needs us to wipe out the bad guys here to save it. We're up against a sea variant of Stooges, similar to what we fought earlier. Thankfully, Rabbit Peach equipped with the Electro Dash spark is the perfect counter since these minions are weak to shock attacks. Simple enough. With half of all the sparks already obtained, I thought I could share with you who we have 
so far. Toxic Quick Reflector, Genesis, Exosphere, Electro Dash, Ethereum, Starburst, Pyrostar, Aqua Dash, Electroid, Aquanox, Pyrogeddon, Deathy Star, Cryoblide, Screech! Gotta catch them all! Gotta catch them all! As we delved further into the palace, we learned about some of this world's historical figures such as Lady Vanessia, who after trying her first pumpkin spice latte, never returned home and died in exile because she would never leave where it was created. In the next room, we find the first goon that Cursa sent after us. Edge informs us that they are called Spark Hunters. I try to chase her down right away, but I can't seem to find the right door because all of them keep leading back to this room. Then finally, I saw a crack in the wall, shattered it with Bebo's sonic powers, got the pumpkin spice lady statue to turn, unlock Locking the chamber where the spark hunter named Midnight awaited us. We find the girl who happens to be Rabid Rosalina. Once he sees that she's unharmed, Captain Orion gets teary-eyed while the girl gives this reaction. <laughs> Midnight imprisons the captain, so Rabbit Rosalina joins the fight, giving us four party members for the boss battle. Rosalina's signature technique is a bedtime story sleeping spell that puts enemies in range into a stasis effect, not allowing them to move, shoot, or use techniques for the next couple turns. With all of Midnight's goons frozen, we bum rush her with our busted quartet of teammates, besting her in just two turns. She still has a couple more phases, but the second one was literally a cakewalk up to her on the first turn, bombarding her with attacks, not even giving her a chance to strike back. The final phase was very reminiscent of the first one. We couldn't quite reach her the first go around, but we were safe the whole time with Rosa's magic book. The final turn was just like all of our rush ones, surrounding Midnight and overwhelming her with our dashes and weapons. Do it. Nah. There's no Emperor to persuade Edge to kill in cold blood. Rabid Rosalina, who I'll just call Rosa or Rosalina from now on, joins the party, bringing with her some purified energy. Just gonna check on a few side quests before leaving. Unfortunately, I can't try this one yet until I have 19 sparks. I'll be back for you, baby. Mwah. The secret level for this planet was more puzzle oriented as opposed to the first one which was more focused on encounters. Then there's the professor's mystery riddle. I'll be honest, I didn't even pay attention to the words. Spun a few widgets and whoa bam figured it out by accident. Let's set sail to world 3 which is known for its infamous pumpkin spice. Also, pumpkin spice is overrated. My genie! Was that a joke? The warden of Pallet Prime, named Woodrow, doesn't happen to be in any trouble because his rhymes actually spring bad luck onto whatever he speaks to. However, the plaza and forest entrance seem to have been corrupted by Darkness. We approach the puddled mess, find a big chunky spark is trapped within it too, knock the lights out of a new enemy species, and enter the forest. Twinkle from Beacon Beach followed us here and decided to join the war against Cursa with us by empowering Beepo, with the ability to find hidden objects that will help us move further in our adventure. Once again, we find Professor Backpack stuck waiting for us to solve his puzzle. And once again, I just guessed where everything was supposed to go. What the crap is with these riddles? I literally just laid stuff down and got lucky. Anyways, as we descend below the forest, we find the roots corrupting Pallet Prime. The Electrogeddon spark is trapped within it too. So we begin the extermination. No! <laughs> What in the name of the Easter Bunny is this Miss Piggy abomination? Those deserve to be bullied. Trip them up, Peach. A new field jumping mechanic is also introduced. These springboards are very useful since they don't count as your teammate jump, which you only usually get one of. And here are the Ghost Walkers, one of many different kinds of magic users. We're not concerned about them right now, though. Let's get out of here, Peach. With the curse of the forest dispelled, animals roam free, and things kept getting easier as I progressed. So I cranked up the difficulty to the max. It gave me this in return. Back on the surface, we witness an explosive brawl in one of the plaza houses. Bowser? What's going on here? Do my eyes deceive me? A literal blockhead? Bowser sneaks in a headbutt, but the blockhead hits back harder and gives a Super Mario 64-esque tail swing into the darkness. Edge fills us in on the blockhead, that she is a spark hunter for Cursa named Bedrock. Additionally, Beepo insists that we can't leave Bowser to die, so he gives Bowser a bazooka to defend himself? We just gave our worst enemy a bazooka. Zuka. This is going to be one long boss battle. Just look at how little the Dukes did to Bedrock. And she attacks back? Oh, jeez. I had Rabid Mario activate his spark to regenerate HP the next couple of turns since he's likely to experience quite a beatdown. Bowser's fortified spark increases our defenses for what's to come and blows up any nearby foes trying to sneak up on us. Since Luigi is frail yet more powerful from a distance, I have him set up camp here. Luigi also possesses the Hero Sight technique, firing at any moving target during the opponent's turn. 20 minutes into battle and Bedrock hasn't even lost half of her health. Hello, okay, Bowser. 
Without Bowser, this fight seemed impossible. But then Beepo chimed in saying we should lure Bedrock into the traps. He actually mentioned this at the beginning, but I somehow missed it. Bedrock takes a leap of anger and wow, now that's what I call damage. Those traps literally took away all the difficulty this boss had to offer. A few more missiles and that's GG, Bedrock. While cooling off from the brawl, Bowser explains that he wants revenge since Cursa has mind controlled his minions. Unsure if we should accept his self-invitation into our party, Genie calculates that by allowing Bowser to join us, our mission success rate increases by 11.34756%. Bowser does promise not to pound us a bits until after we pummel Cursa. Fine, Bowser, take us to where we need to go next. It's here where we meet the lumberjack who ironically is having trouble chopping wood. Woodrow sent us to him to fix the bridge near the plaza. However, he cannot since someone has stolen his axe. Vampastra, the spark, claims to have seen who stole it. So we follow him to a secluded house. Beepo demands the tenant let us in, but the rabbit named Hinky asks if we have a warrant or he's gonna call his lawyer. He at least tips us off to check on his neighbor who coincidentally just got a new axe. Before checking in on the new suspect, I swing by the secret level which has wild claws in the overworld along with some puzzle light moments using Beepo's scanner. The spark you get as a reward is one heck of a mob boss. It straight up summons a wild claw. How cool is that? Back to the axe burglar investigation. The newly accused rabbit claims he did not steal it. He tells us to go ask his other neighbor who supposedly sees everything. Guess what? They weren't home. So we bust open their diary. People read that someone called the fork told the owner of this diary that they saw someone running around with an axe. Talk about a fetch quest. Anywho, we confront the fork who won't spill anything they saw until we find the magic whetstone for them. Then Pastor knows where it's at, so we scan the area upon arrival, bring it back to the fork, who then tells us to go back to the first suspect, and voila! They there it is. In order to retrieve the axe from the Dark Mist puzzle, we have to go all the way around this level. My favorite thing in this entire game is how scared the squashettes are when you aim at them. There's something just hilarious about the face they make before meeting their doom. In the end, the axe is back with its rightful owner. The story doesn't end there, though. Hinky was told by the Dryad to steal it, to prevent young trees from being chopped down. We find the Dryad in the forest to help find a solution for their conflicting goals. I'll spare you all the nonsense of these fetch quests they sent me on. It sufficeth me to say that the Lumberjack and Dryad made up, agreeing only to chop down very old trees. They fixed the bridge together and are now in love. Movie on. We hop aboard our ship approaching Terra Flora. Before landing, we question Edge how she knew about the last two spark hunters, but tells us to mind our own business. On to World 4. Genie shares her analysis with us that this planet is going through a drought, as the water volcano has gone dormant. Sullivan, chief engineer of the Wiggler Express Railway, expresses his infatuation for Genie, and also shares that the tracks are being blocked by darkness. He advised us to check out the Everbloom tree to find something that could navigate him across Terra Flora. <sighs> Beepo assumes the voice to be the spirit of the Everbloom tree. So into the tree we go. We view many of the pieces of art explaining the story of Bia, former singer turned organic farmer warden of Stardew Valley. Oh, Professor, do you have another mindless quote-unquote puzzle for me? Turns out it was an actual puzzle that made a miniature version of the Wiggler Express. Further down the tree, we meet Bia in person. Beepo thought she was the spirit of the Everbloom, but really her throat was just being affected by all the dry air. She asks Drizzle, the spark, to go along with us, enabling Beepo the ability to nourish vines. All you gotta do is spam some sonic waves and there you go, a new path. With it, we summon vines to cross the floating aisles of Terra Flora, leading us to the Wiggler Express. The main story says to stay on track, but I couldn't help myself finding every collectible I could before boarding the train. A long while later, then all aboard the train. And into the darkness we go. Something followed us though, something big. A ginormous Wiggler. Slug you. Looks like the angry Wiggler is under the control of Darkness eyes. No need to worry. Peach's shotgun makes quick work of them, sometimes obliterating five of them at once. Out the darkness portal we go. Whoa, that's some dodgy frame rate right there. Probably what wore out the wheels that made us stop. Sullivan can't repair it either since there are purple vines in the way. A spark called the Oozer Master overhears and offers to help. Engine trouble? Can I help? I love trains! I'm pretty sure that's my son. He is obsessed with trains. We really didn't need a temp because Beepo's power smithers away the vines for us. Some can only be accessed inside the water volcano. So inside we went. And we're blocked by a a stupid boulder. It's not just a boulder. It's a rock. 
I noticed some water leaking out of the boulder, rock, whatever. So I found some other rocks, placed them over the geysers, and kablam! Then we're already at the final level in relation to the main story. To reactivate the water volcano, we must destroy the dark mist dams holding in the water. There are three in total, and they can be blown up with these vials that are conveniently nearby. Gotta love Rabbit's logic. This map is loaded with snipers and depleters that can not only strike back when attacked, but also lifesteal. Rabbit Peach is the only hero that can heal, so her ability was crucial to winning this. Yet Mario Rabbit was still knocked out. Luckily, Peach's movement range was just enough to blast the final dam, giving us the purified energy we needed, along with erupting the magical water from the volcano, reviving all of the plant life on Terra Flora. Bia expresses her gratitude, then cancels all approved vacation requests to catch up on flower orders. There are still a few things to check off the list before leaving. Of course, there's a puzzle in the secret level, and there are still a few more purple vines left that are blocking Sullivan's train. Even after clearing all of them, there's a dark mist puzzle that remains at the end of the track. It's a unique situation requiring you to reach the train by flicking enough switches to spawn enough platforms in order to reach the locomotive. Once beaten, you're given a glimpse of Sullivan cleaning and repairing his train, and my does it look good. There's another side character called the Alka Mentor who will let a spark join your team after you concoct a potion, adding the ingredients as listed on the back wall without having the cauldron be the bottom color when tossing in the listed object on the top row. By the way, there's this one survival level where the portals only send out armored Goombas to each turn. Why are they acting like these guys are so hard to beat eight turns in a row? Anyhow, we set our flight path to the fifth world where Edge suspects the final spark hunter will be waiting for us. Since there's an electro-geomagnetic storm in the atmosphere, our heroes will have to jump ship. I went skydiving. We probably would have died, but Rabbit Convenient Logic provided us with a balloon to break our fall, which Bowser then pops. The whole reason we came to this planet was to find this lady called Mama who could upgrade our ship to take on Cursa. Although she's not happy with us for popping her balloon. Even if she wanted to, she couldn't because the windmill is not working properly, meaning there's no power. Just like previous destinations, we have to clear some darkness to get through. One in particular featuring a special mission with Bowser and Luigi. Our duo starts separated from each other with the goal of surviving eight turns. Bowser can take a few hits by himself, but Luigi is a sitting duck if the enemy gangs up on him. Thus, I had him use the unseen spark to be invisible for two turns, giving Luigi just enough time to cower next to King Koopa. Luigi also acquired the high ground art of the skill tree, increasing his crit rate to 100% when attacking an opponent from above. Server Anakin! I have the high ground! Since Bowser was taking all of the hits, the regen spark was a great resource to keep him alive. Overall, they made quite the survival team. As we hiked to the windmill site, we learned that Mama is called Mama because of all the ravage she saved from Reptar. Shortly after we enter the site, dark mist levels get a little trickier with pipes that have on and off switches. Another picture showed us that Mama taught the rabbits how to create inventions that would help them. Rabbits are still rabbits though, which means we have to fix some incomplete electrical circuits, including one from Professor Backpack himself. As for enemy minions, Magikoopas now pose a threat which can empower its allies and target multiple heroes with one attack. You can bet I won't let that guy last for long. Job site has proudly worked over 12 minutes without accident or injury. Edge and Mario dive into their own special mission, where my Italian friend skill tree now allows him to have essentially no cooldown when using his hero sight technique. No wild claw ever got close to our tower once we secured the location. Finally, the dark mist corrupted windmill was in sight. Cleaning it up was wasn't enough. We also had to protect the machinery. Adversity was swarming from four different bridges. Leaving any side open wasn't an option. So I summoned some trusty minions to slow down incoming forces, whether it be by means of destroying them or serving as a distraction. Shock panels helped too. With the power back on, the world is much more vibrant. Which means Mama should be able to soup up our ride now? Looks like the last spark hunter, Daphne, has kidnapped Mama, and we're forced to fight on her turf. With the help of some pipes and team jumps, Rabbit Mario was able to reach Daphne on the second turn and clobber the HP away. And Eclipse brings a new phase, which like before, more team jumps and more pipes. Wait, hold on a second. <laughs> bring us to Daphne our second turn, where she is swiftly beaten again. The third phase took longer than the ones before because of all this terrain we had to traverse. Same results in the end, though. Then Cursa comes out of nowhere, explodes momentarily, revealing Rosalina was controlled inside Cursa the whole time. I thought this game was supposed to be surprising. Whatever. Rosalina casts a portal just before she is sucked back into Cursa, giving us just enough of a window to escape. With the last piece of purified energy, Rosalina was also able to convey the history of Cursa inside it. 
it. A fragment of the Mega Bug, the final boss from the previous Mario Rabbids game, had merged slowly with stellar debris. Cursa felt the power of the Lumas, then initiated an invasion on the Comet Observatory. Rosalina stood up to the threat, saving the Lumas, but unfortunately was merged with Cursa, having no control. So what are we gonna use to get into Cursa's stronghold? A rubber ducky? question how that happened. However, before taking on the final boss, two baddies stand in our way. The first being Dark Miss Bowser. Our very own Bowser is required to take part, of course. However, I made a fatal mistake of separating Peach from the rest of the gang before armoring everyone up. This resulted in my star player, Rabid Mario, to get swarmed by a bombardment of enemy attacks with no protection. You see, what makes Peach so great is her technique that gives barriers to nearby allies. These completely nullify a number of attacks during the enemy's following turn. Thankfully, Rabid Peach was there to make Rabid Mario last longer. We still managed to rush down the more evil Bowser, and our King Koopa fittingly landed the kill shot. Next up was the penultimate foe, Dark Miss Edge. Just look at all those pipes and jump pads. I swear, you're just asking to be dash attacked to death at this point. What a breeze of a fight. Afterwards, Edge reveals to us that she was created by Cursa and was the former leader of the Spark Hunters, who eventually saw the light. Again, is this supposed to be surprising? With the past behind us, we load into the gold cannon, launching off to our final destination. The party is scattered across three different battlefields. The goal? Get rid of those darn hands that are following me. I equipped as many shockwave sparks that I could to get rid of the other nonsense minions. Then in order to damage the hand in a proficient manner, you have to jump off a specific pad that summons a spike, get grabbed and tossed, then chill next to it. At the end of the turn, the hand will attempt an attack but get stabbed instead. When it comes to Rabbit Mario and the Luigis, the trio has to be very very careful since none of them can heal or defend each other. So I use the gather round spark to surround Rabbit Mario, who then pounds them all into the pavement. Stabby stab time. With the final trio, I learned the hard way that the hand doesn't only grab the hero it's pointing at, whether you team jump or bounce off a nearby pad. You really gonna try to smash Bowser? He's got spikes of his own, bro. Once both of Cursa's hands are defeated, or arms, I guess, we go directly after Cursa next. This weakens them just enough for a horde of Lumas to break free from Cursa. Rosalina escaped as well and cast a protection spell immediately to stay free of Cursa's wrath. The final boss is now in their final form, but thankfully Rosalina took measures to create wand projections. What you want to do with these is fire your weaponry at them to fill up the gauge which triggers an attack sequence for Rosalina. Rabid Rosalina keeps this group safe with her Anui spell, and if that wasn't enough, Peach provides barriers. Needless to say, these three were absolutely comfortable. Rabid Mario though had to be up close to the galactic monstrosity, if he wanted to contribute at all. He is the only hero that can retreat after attacking thanks to his skill tree. But Cursa wasn't the only threat to run from. There were also portals which summoned enemies on different points of the map, leading to the downfall of the Rabid Plumber. I expected something like this to happen, thus I equipped Luigi with a spark that could revive fallen associates. All three of these guys had to stay on their toes if they wanted to survive. Then there was Bowser. He had Rabid Peach by his side, but her healing had a cooldown and the king was the tankiest of the bunch, resulting in him walling most of the incoming strikes. A few turns later, he could not go any further. This squad was the least useful of the three since these oozers would often disable our main attacks, as you can see here. What they lacked, the other factions made up for with their raw strength, frequently powering up Rosalina. For some reason, Cursa's HP never lowered. Nonetheless, the next blast from Rosalina was enough to best Cursa once and for all. Our heroes fire one last shot together, saving the galaxy. We gather back at Peach's castle, and I think Bowser's having a hard time adjusting to his new friends. Then he blurts out, We still need to 100% the game! Obviously, a lot of the completionist stuff remaining can be tedious and uninteresting. So let me walk you through the highlights. Remember her? Well, hello, beautiful. I actually lost to this fat so, even though I'm way over leveled coming back to it. Giant Squashette couldn't be dashed, so I did it to the minions instead. Using Starburst beforehand made the dashing more effective, and Rabbit Peach would protect us with the Fortify Spark. If the dashing wasn't enough, Rosa would use Pyrogeddon to clear them out, since these Arctic enemies hated the heat. And to be extra cautious, Rabbit Mario would go unseen since he was always shoulder to shoulder with them. When he wasn't invisible, this busted spell would be our solace in between turns. A lot of pounding later, finally made the squashette fall. <laughs>
Sometimes the hardest moments of 100%ing a game are the hidden collectibles you missed on your first visit, like this turtle containing a memory behind this wall. And not just collectibles, there are hidden side quests you need to backtrack for with the new tech you got along the journey. Odd that they consider this a quest when no one tasks you with it. Here's another that took me a while to find. Once you discover the starting point for the quest, it's easy peasy, just gotta find them first. After I found everything there, I went to unlock the third world spark pipe. In my opinion, this is the hardest boss fight in the game. The giant depleter could attack, counter, and lifesteal. How frustrating is that with its huge amount of HP? I needed the three princesses. And a wild claw to take some hits for us. But perhaps the most important ally was the oozer. Its ability to prevent the giant from attacking was a god. Send. That meant it wouldn't only counterattack, but also would lifesteal that turn. I couldn't prevent it from attacking all the time, which made this battle go on forever. And if you just so happen to have two heroes next to each other, the depleter would double steal. On top of that, whenever a new portal showed up, I would have to spend two of my attacks on it, just to make sure no new enemies appeared, because this monster was already too much to handle on its own. 27 minutes of this nonsense finally brought us the victory. And here's a stupid memory hiding behind these bushes. Anyways, I progressed to the fourth world spark pipe, where a giant magic koopa awaited me. I was expecting another difficult, drawn-out fight, but to my surprise, all this guy did was summon Goombas. No problem with those here. What a relief. Before leaving Terra Flora, I found a new vine path I must have missed earlier, which led to the last quest on this planet. Then I just left because don't you dare ask how long I spent looking for these memories. It was on to finish the last side quest on the final world. There was one where the bad guy smacked me right into the gold zone. Thank Thanks, I guess? This one challenged me to enter the danger zone. where I saved this robot from tentacles through the power of quakes, punches, and shotguns. With that rescue came the second last spark, which prompted me to seek out the last one from the secret room. A little bit of electrical engineering later unlocked the only spark that remained. So many new friends, let's finish the rap! Glitter, Pulsar, Gargantra Fan, Squash Up Master, Vamp Dash, Scoper Master, Wild Claw Master, Zephyr Quake, Aqua Quake, Toxic Comet, Cryo Geddon, Zephyr Dash, Electro Geddon, Vampastra, Oozer Master! I must really be in last for everything mood, because now we're at the last spark pipe where we must take down a giant magnafowl. This big fella can't travel very far, so as long as you stay spread out and heal who was recently hit, this objection can be cleared easily, especially since the other minions don't close on you very fast. All that remained were the tedious treasure hunts, such as looking for this rabid's missing art piece, which I must have dropped here earlier. Finding this stupid hidden crate that was needed for a quest, and breaking open this storage unit. Yet, I couldn't figure out for the life of me why every area was reporting only 99% completion. Well, turns out when you re-enter the secret levels, they all offer a time trial that if you finish in time, you're awarded a weapon skin. And at long last, I stumbled upon the two undiscovered memories. One at the train station, and the other just across yet another vine I did not grow. 100%ing each world gives you the gift of a gleaming weapon. Then I got scared. How is there a weapon skin missing? Oh, thank goodness. When you reopen the menu, a message from the team that made this game congratulate you with the final skin. The work is done. I won. Woo! This sequel was such a blast. Give the video a like to support the video and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more content like this. You all have a good one. Thanks.